Welcome to my channel. My name is Genevieve and today we are going to talk about the murder of Margaret Peggy Beck. So something that I've always been really fascinated by is obscure history or really mysterious history or just things that happen that are very out of the ordinary and also that tend to not have a full explanation and this murder of Peggy Beck is one of those cases. So this will probably become a regular thing on my channel. I plan to at least once a week release a video about some sort of mystery or obscure thing that still needs to be solved. And if you are interested in that kind of thing, I highly encourage you to like this video and subscribe to my channel. So let's just jump right into it because this case has a lot going on and it has recently kind of unearthed from the bowels of history as kind of a closed unsolved mystery and just about a couple months ago it was released by the Jefferson County investigation team that they have found the suspect aka the for sure killer of this case by using DNA genealogical testing. And it is considered the oldest case to ever be solved with this kind of DNA because this DNA is 57 years old. It's 57 year old DNA that they've now been able to use through cool genealogical testing to finally find a definitive answer of who this person was that killed this 16 year old girl Peggy Beck 57 years ago. But even so, we have a name and we have an identity, I guess, but there are still, for me, so many unanswered questions and like hows and whys and just weird stuff about the story that is unanswered. So I'm hoping in sharing the story with you in as much detail as I have, maybe together we can work out what really happened the night that Peggy Beck mysteriously was murdered. So let's start with Peggy's story from the beginning. So Peggy was born to Clarence and Myrna Beck in 1946 in Edgewood, Colorado. She ended up being the oldest of four girls, so she has three little sisters. And the family was probably considered like working middle class. Back in the 50s and 60s, Edgewood, Colorado, which is now considered just a suburb of Denver, but back then it was considered kind of like its own town, but Denver has since then grown around it and it's just a suburb. And it was a town that was, yeah, for like working middle-class family. So her family wasn't by any means really wealthy, but by all accounts, as we know, they were a pretty normal working class middle, middle class family. Peggy was described by her sisters as being a very protective and loyal and caring older sister. She really cared about her family. And when she was nine years old, she joined the Girl Scouts. And the Girl Scouts obviously became a bit of a passion for her. She stuck with it and she made her way up through the ranks until unfortunately the time of her death, right before she turned 17. So the summer of 1963, she is 16 years old. She is in the summer before her senior year of high school and she is super excited according to her family because this will be the first year that she gets to be one of the counselors at Girl Scout camp that year. So you can imagine this was probably a really big life step for her. She felt like she was probably really growing up by being able to step into this role of being one of the leaders at the Girl Scout camp as opposed to just being one of the campers. And it was something that she had really been looking forward to all summer. And now in August, she is finally going up to the ranch. So the Girl Scout camp takes place at this place called Flying G Ranch, which is in Pike National Forest. In the mountains of Colorado, it is not really anywhere near Edgewater. And that's something to keep in mind because that's gonna be an important piece of the mystery later on. So she goes to this ranch, Flying G Ranch. She's in the mountains. She's not anywhere near Edgewater. And she gets up there and it's a five day, four night camping trip. And she's having a blast. She has a great rapport with the other campers. She's really well liked and seen as a great leader of all these younger girls who are on this Girl Scout camping trip. 
And then on the fourth night, so this is the last night, they're slated to go home the very next day. On this fourth night, Peggy's tent mate, whose name was Claudia, um, apparently fell ill. And there's still no question as to like exactly what she has. There's some reports that she said she just had symptoms of a cold, but she was ill enough that Claudia, her tent mate, had to go sleep in the infirmatory and Peggy was left to sleep in her tent alone that night. Then the next morning, it's the last day of camp. They're all gathering to have their last breakfast together and they notice that Peggy hasn't shown up for breakfast. So what do they do? They send Claudia, her tent mate, to go check on her because, you know, maybe she also got sick. Maybe she's staying in bed because she's too sick to get up. But unfortunately, Claudia discovered Peggy was dead in her sleeping bag. Okay, so here's where mystery and a lot of questions are raised for me. So this poor girl, Claudia, has walked into her tent. Also, I should mention when I say tents, I don't mean the kind of tents that we use today for camping that are kind of those low to the ground pop-up tents. These tents in the Girl Scout camps, they were wooden structures that looked almost like mini houses that had canvas tent material over them. So they were almost like little huts that you could more easily walk in and out of without having to like, you know, get on the ground and crawl. So anyway, poor Claudia discovers her tent mate is deceased. And what's really odd about all of this is Whoever was in charge, whoever the adults were, and their names, I couldn't find them, they weren't released, or I just don't know who they are, they just assumed that it was a natural death. So what they claim is that they looked at Peggy, they didn't see any obvious things wrong with her, she just looked like she was cozy in her sleeping bag, which was still fully zipped up around her, and they saw no evidence of foul play. Everything in her tent looked normal and she just looked like she was sleeping in her sleeping bag and she just died. And the next thing about this that maybe, I don't know, maybe this is like a difference between like the 1960s versus today, but they didn't even call the police when this otherwise healthy 16 year old girl just randomly dies. They don't see any obvious things wrong with her so they assume it's natural. So it's like all they really did, I guess, was like call the parents in the mortuary, I guess. And can you imagine that call home to parents? Like, hey, so looks like Peggy just randomly died in the night. So, you know, we're gonna have Claudia pack up her things and, you know, bring them to you. Cause that's the other thing that they did is they made Claudia, the other teenager that was her tent mate, Claudia is the one that had to pack up all her stuff and, and clean up and get that stuff to her parents. What? So here's the thing. Eight hours later, after they discovered that Peggy had died in her sleeping bag, it was eight hours until any sort of authorities or police were notified. Why did it take eight hours? Well, what they claim is that after that amount of time, that's when they were able to see the fingerprint marks start to develop on her neck. And then once they noticed that, they took a closer look at her body. They found that she had been sleeping in a leotard and underwear, and both the leotard and the underwear were ripped. And then what was really telling and what actually helped solve the case in 2020 is under her fingernails, they were caked with human blood and skin. So whoever had attacked Peggy that night of August 17th, 1963, she had scratched the mother loving expletive out of their face. So obviously now they know that not only was Peggy murdered, but she was also sexually assaulted. And what's truly unfortunate about that whole situation is because they've waited eight hours, they've also totally cleaned up the crime scene because Claudia packed up all her stuff and cleaned the tent. They have very little to go off of to figure out who it was that did this to Peggy. 
In terms of suspects for this case, the only man that was legitimately on site at the Flying G Ranch that night was the groundskeeper and he ended up passing a polygraph test and proved to be legitimate. So they really didn't have many other leads. The entire rest of the Girl Scout camps was obviously young girls and women and it was very clear from the, the fingerprint marks on Peggy's neck that it was obviously a man who had done this to her. So after a lot of media fanfare and a lot of mentioned suspects who ended up being dead ends and weren't actually involved in the case, fast forward to April 2020. They saved all of those blood and skin shavings from the suspect's face. They froze it and 57 years later through genealogical testing, they were able to definitively, definitively, definitively identify the suspect as, drumroll, James Raymond Taylor. Okay, so who is James Raymond Taylor? So he was not initially considered a suspect in the original investigation in 1963. He was not even on anyone's radar. He was a totally random dude. At the time of this attack and murder, James Raymond Taylor was 23 years old. He was married at that time, and he lived in Edgewater, Colorado, and worked as a television repairman. But did you hear that right? James also lived in Edgewater, Colorado. That town that is not anywhere near the Flying G Ranch that also happened to be the small community that Peggy Beck herself was from. So here's the deal. James Raymond Taylor did have a connection to the Flying G Ranch. Because he was this television repairman, he had a knack for fixing and making ham radios, which were a big form of communication back in the day. So he had been up to the Flying G Ranch to fix and like maintenance their ham radios. And that is his only known connection to Flying G Ranch. According to Peggy's family and other sources, he and Peggy did not know each other. They had no connection to each other. But that might be up for debate as there are some theories. So it's 57 years later. James Raymond Taylor's family has been very cooperative with investigators in providing them information of all they know about uh, Mr. Taylor. But James Raymond Taylor has not been heard from hide nor tail since 1976 when he apparently took off for Las Vegas. If James Raymond Taylor was alive today, he would be 80 years old. And I don't know about you, but I'm not getting the impression that this guy was like the picture of health. So investigators have been looking for him for about seven months and it seems like he just sort of disappeared. After he went to Vegas in 1976, it's like he just disappeared. And what I can only hope is that hopefully he got his. So it's not definitive that he's dead, but in my mind, I'm just like, how could this guy still be alive? He, he wasn't exactly like making choices that were going for longevity, you know? So here's the thing about this case that still really boggles my mind. And that is, this is a Girl Scout camp, okay? It's all women and they're all pretty isolated in the wilderness. It's like if there was a guy like just standing in the woods, like staring at them, waiting for one of them to be alone in a tent, like he would have been noticed. And at the time, there were reports of a quote unquote prowler seen apparently in the area, but not near the camp um, apparently that week. But, but no one at the camp the whole trip, no one noted anything out of the ordinary. They didn't report hearing anything abnormal and it was apparently just a very regular night. And yet, this guy, James Raymond Taylor, was smart enough and somehow calculated enough to be waiting in this wilderness 
for four nights. Because I can only imagine he was waiting for the moment that either Peggy herself would be alone or that any one of those girls would be alone in a tent. So he had to be really stealthy enough and calculated enough to be keeping tabs on them while not being seen himself for four freaking nights. Because in my mind, there's just no way that he happened to stumble upon the Girl Scout camp that night. He happened to pick the tent that had a lone girl in it, and he just happened to leave the crime scene so meticulous and making it look as if she, you know, just died in her sleep. That just doesn't happen. This was committed by someone who knew what he was doing. He thoroughly planned it out. So that leads me to my next question, and that's whether or not he targeted Peggy specifically, or if it was just he was just going to go for whatever girl was alone in a tent that night. To me, it seems kind of like a creepy, sick coincidence that both of them were from this small community of Edgewater, Colorado. Did he know Peggy? Did he even maybe even have like a friendship or even a relationship with her? There's one theory that maybe Peggy was openly having an affair with this 23 year old married man and maybe she invited him up to Girl Scout camp to like hang out with her when she was alone. But that just that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me personally because I'm like if that was true that they had a legitimate consensual arrangement, why would he need to murder her? But what I do believe could be a legitimate theory is that maybe he had seen Peggy around town and maybe even knew somehow that she was a Girl Scout, maybe even obviously knew that she was going to go on this Girl Scout trip at the very ranch that he had been working on their ham radios. Which leads to my next question of if he really did follow Peggy specifically up to the ranch for that week, did he somehow get Claudia, her tent mate, sick? Because that's the other crazy part of the story that blows my mind. That if Claudia, her tent mate, had not been in the infirmatory that night, and if Peggy had not been left alone, none of this would have happened. And it seems like more of a coincidence, at least to me, that the very night that Claudia got sick was the night that Peggy got taken advantage of. It's very clear that someone was watching them. Someone was maybe even, I don't know how he would have gotten Claudia sick because again, I don't know how he would have somehow appeared at the Girl Scout camp without getting caught. It seems more than just like a stumbled upon opportunity. But then again, maybe he truly did not know Peggy and maybe he really had just come up that night and had gone from tent to tent and was looking for a tent that only had one girl in it. So I don't know. It's just, it brings up so many questions. And then the way that the, I don't know, the Girl Scout team handled it, that they just saw her dead the next day and just assumed it's like totally normal for an otherwise totally healthy 16 year old to just die in her sleep and they don't even call authorities. like. Again, maybe this is like a 1960s thing, but in my mind, if <laughs> if you stumbled upon a deceased 16-year-old girl, you'd want to call maybe the police first, I guess. That's just where my mind goes. So 57 years later, the case of Peggy Beck's murder has technically been solved and that the suspect has definitively been identified we still don't know where James Taylor Raymond is. We don't know if he's living or dead, or maybe he changed his identity or appearance in the 1970s. Um, there's still a lot of questions. Since Peggy passed in 1963, her death was preceded by both of her parents, but her three younger siblings are still alive. And the resurgence of all this new information has obviously brought up a lot of emotions for them and I'm sure that they would really like some more closure on this. So in the description below I have left the contact information for the Jefferson County Police Department. They're the ones that are handling this case. So if you happen to have any information on James Raymond Taylor, 
any legitimate information on where he might be. Again, he would be 80 years old today. So if he were alive right now, he would be, you know, pretty dang old, probably not look much like the picture that I've showed you guys. But if you have any information on him, please let the Jefferson County Police Department know. I hope that you enjoyed following along in this video. It was really interesting for me to do all the research on Peggy and to just try to dig deeper into this case. And it seemed like the more I dug, just the more questions I had because this is such a bizarre situation that just does not happen every day, which we are so thankful for. Again, if you would like to see more of my mysteries and murders, I will be uploading a video on a different case every week. So please subscribe and like this video to see more from me. I'll see you next time.